Our next speaker is Dr. Birch. Uh, Dr. Birch is professor of orthopedic surgery at UCSF and will be speaking about surgical navigation uh, in complex spine surgery. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, and again, thanks, Lionel and Kyle and Lee, for putting this uh, program on. It's, uh, it, it's great, and you know, please keep doing it. So, you know, what this talks about is just trying to um, deliver kind of personalized and customized uh, medicine. So once we figure out who we should operate on, this is kind of how we uh, make it as accurate as, as possible. Um, so here are my disclosures. Um, and the, really the overview of the talk is about navigation, what it is, application to deformity surgery, and then, you know, some um, thoughts on future applications. So, you know, this fits into, you know, what navigation is, is it really fits into the accuracy of surgical technique. So we've heard a lot about pre-op planning. And once we've got that plan, then we have to deliver it to the patient. It's one thing to have a sophisticated pre-op plan, but if you can't deliver it, then the outcome's probably not going to be very good. So when you look at navigation, the publications on navigation, it's really kind of increased over time, especially in, um, you know, as it relates to uh, deformity surgery. So there's about 400 uh, publications so far on, on navigation as it applies to spine surgery. Um, and, you know, when you go through it, most of it uh, looks at how accurate navigation is. And it really kind of is uh, all about like placing screws. And you look at it, you know, so there's variability 95 to 98%. And probably the variability there is just on a knowledge and skill of, of how you use the, um, the, the technique. Um, we published, uh, Alagos and I published on our uh, series of mine, 20 patients, 21 patients, uh, placing subaxial uh, pedicle screws back in um, 2015. So, you know, the series was uh, earlier than that. And we had about a 99% accuracy rate in, you know, pedicles. It's from C3 to C7. 99% um, seems unbelievably good, but um, that's what we published on. So I think, you know, if you know how to do it, it's pretty accurate. And rather than being accurate, I think the most important thing, um, and it's something that as surgeons we really want to have in the operating room, is predictability. So if you know what you're going to do and how to do it, and it's reproducible every single time, that makes it um, a really useful tool. And I find that navigation is extremely predictable, but you have to know how to use it. It's a tool, and it only works when you know how to use it. If you don't know how to use it, it's it just becomes you know um, a really expensive paperweight. So, and again, you know this whole thing is we're trying to prevent complications and we're, uh, we want to add ease to the procedure. And it's amazing how many people have not adopted um, this this type of thing. It it you know maybe the adoption in the um, you know nationally is maybe twenty percent. So there's still a lot of room for growth. Um, but I think that, you know, adoption of this, we can improve outcomes and, and quality of care, and, and uh, that indirectly decreases the cost of care. And again, I can't drive it home enough. Navigation is a tool, and it's a technique. It's not just something you turn on and, like, magically, you know, uh, it works. You have to really understand how to use it. <clears throat> and, you know, I use this case. Uh, I'm sure people have seen this case before. You know, this is an NF case uh, fracture. I mean, this is a very difficult case. And you're not going to start uh, learning navigation on this case, um, but it's something where, like, if you didn't have navigation, it would be a very, very uh, tough day, and you'd definitely get punched in the face by it. But knowing how to use navigation, the case is doable, and it actually doesn't, it turns out to be not that hard of a case, just to instrument and, and fix that fracture. And so for those people who say, well, I don't need navigation, I don't use it, I mean, we're all kind of using some kind of image guidance. So whether you're taking x-rays post-op or pre-op or whether you're using a ton of fluoroscopy to try and put your pedicle screws in, you're still using some form of image guidance. But it's time to evolve. 
And really what it is, navigation is not so much image guidance, but it's more the art of registration. And that's the key. If you understand how to register the anatomy to the image and how to maintain that registration, then you know how to navigate. And so, you know, back in, way back when, frames used to be bolted to people and the frame would have to be in the image and then you could figure out where you're, where you're going. But, you know, we've evolved into frameless navigation. And so really we're trying to overlay the physical space, the image space and the tracker space. And we have to, that process of overlaying and maintaining that accuracy of that overlay is the process of registration. And there's a mathematical um, calculation, a transformation that allows that to happen. So think about it, you have the image coordinates, um, you have the, the physical space coordinates, and then you have to, you know, uh, register that to the patient with fiducials. And typically we use marker-based uh, pair point registration, although you can use image-to-image -image registration, which can be useful when you're trying to take an intraoperative CT scan and, and register it to an MRI uh, for some tumor work. So again, here we go. Um, we're just trying to get the line of sight on the, on the fiducials of the patient onto the, uh, um, onto the um, sort of the, the uh, markers of the uh, uh, O-arm there, and uh, we're gonna overlay it. And there's this uh, transformation, rotation, linear translation that turns into um, how the, how the uh, anatomy and the image space is, is aligned. But there's intrinsic error in that process. So there's uh, kind of three errors when you think of any kind of uh, navigation system. So there's localization error. So think of it, if you're using an optical system, the spheres might be a little bit deformed and you're not gonna get perfect localization. Or there's registration error where you're not going to have uh, a perfect scan. So there might be a little a distortion in the scan. And then the tracker registration error, as it moves away from its target, you're gonna get some error there too. But that, that error um, is pretty, pretty small, so anywhere between you know, half a millimeter to two millimeters. But where the errors come in in navigation, typically, and you know, we hear all oh, navigation's always off and never works, it's really the surgeon, and it's the extrinsic errors. It's like the, these list of eight things that we as surgeons introduce into the process where we screw up the navigation. So either patient positioning, image quality, et cetera, et cetera. But the, um, you know, the two most important things are not understanding how to uh, get out of the line of sight issue. So where you put your reference frame. And then the other thing is how to place your reference frame so that it maintains stability. If you know those two things, you're 80% there. But all those other things also contribute to um, errors in how navigation is used. All right, so we'll kind of walk through a case here. Is a 50-year-old, 54-year-old female with low back pain, uh, neck pain. She's had a prior T12 fracture, difficulty walking, difficulty standing up straight, uh, quite disabled. Um, so the plan here is to do an anterior reconstruction, L2 to S1, T3 to S1 posterior spinal fusion. We're gonna do a PSO, pelvic fixation using S2A eye screws and pelvic bolts and then obviously correction of the scoliosis and kyphosis. So how do I use navigation in, in this case? Um, so, you know, first of all, why? So the anatomy is challenging. So whether I can hit the pedicles on, you know, every uh, uh, level, um, I'm not sure who I'm operating with is, and I can watch them. And I think that using navigation becomes efficient, accurate, and again, predictability is probably the most important thing. And then you know, we can reduce our radiation by navigating the anterior um, uh, reconstruction of the spine. We can improve the pedicle fill so we can match the pedicles to the, or pedicle screws to the pedicles. Uh, and then I think we can just build an improved construct. So we get a better fusion mass using four rod constructs. S2A screws are um, you know, a big boost to the uh, pelvic stability. And then as a surgeon, I avoid radiation. So I'm not uh, bringing in a ton of fluoro and avoiding radiation is obviously pretty important. Um, and then you can get into more advanced stuff like osteotomy planning, and then you can take that plan, import it into the uh, scan, and then you can um, navigate off the, off the plan and reproduce your osteotomies. So here's an example of uh, anterior reconstruction. So um, ATP, from two to five and then five one through two small incisions. All the cages are navigated. Again, all this is done with the scan and then you can get these cages in without any radiation. So as a surgeon, that's, um, you know, that's very valuable uh, for me. 
so just some pictures of, you know, like visualizing the pedicle, you can match the, the screw to the pedicle size. So maybe at L1, you're going to put in a 5.5 screw and not a 6.5 screw, a 4.5 screw and not a 6.5 screw. And so you don't blow it a pedicle. S2I screws are extremely easy and efficient with navigation. You can see the, uh, you know, the cross-sectional imaging. You can place the screws down the posterior column right above the sciatic notch, get good fixation. And then in this case, we had to do an osteotomy. So how do we do that and how do we use navigation for the osteotomy? Obviously, this is a lumbar uh, PSO and, and we did a T12 PSO in this patient. <clears throat> but we take you know, what we want to do and then we can create a wedge. We can drop that wedge onto the patient and then we can navigate around that wedge and then we can cut accurately to get a reproducible um, you know, angular uh, correction. And then, you know, as navigation evolves, we have better tools. So I'm a big proponent of the Mysonics, the ultrasonic blade, and uh, being able to accurately cut uh, allows us to, and we have an accurate plan. So we're now able to take our plan preoperatively and, and uh, kind of reproduce it um, accurately intraoperatively. Um, and then, you know, with the Mysonics, we get a ton of uh, bone graft. So here's the intraoperative uh, images um, in the, uh, that coronal, you know, the patient was off to her left a little bit, so we readjusted her, got a good sagittal correction there, and then post-op films, um, I overcorrected her, now she's a little bit off to the right, so, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it, she's, she's pretty good, she's three months post-op now, and her, she's pain and, and function is significantly improved, so I was quite happy with it. But again, being able to use navigation, it's all about knowledge of surgical and imaging workflow. Like there's a big disruption and frame placement and line of sight are the big issues. Um, but you know, when you think about all the things that we use in this case, there's a lot of different tools and a lot of different screens and a lot of different uh, sort of back and forth. And to make it efficient, uh, you really need a team. So you need somebody who knows how to run the system that's allowing you to navigate. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I always say is like, you got to get, uh, you got to get a co-pilot, like you got to get somebody who's going to know how to run it and run it efficiently. Otherwise it's, it's a, it's a challenge to use. So what, what are the future, um, aspects of, uh, navigation? Um, here's an example of like image to image registration. So we've taken the intraoperative, uh, um, CT scan and we point to point registered it with an MRI. And again, this is you know, off-label, but um, I've done this a few times for tumor surgery. And then you can essentially map out the, uh, this is a big uh, paraspinal uh, tumor, and you can uh, you know, now uh, take your, your scan and you've got a navigated MRI essentially in the, in the OR. And um, it's, it's quite nice in, in certain cases. And then you know, where the future is going, um, there's a lot of, um, software now that helps us plan so we can get the plan but i think in the future what we're going to be able to do is we're going to take that plan and we're going to have a bunch of virtual k wires that show up in the operating room so that you can plan out your construct and get a nice straight cascade of your screws and then you're going to reproduce that intraoperatively and you're going to be able to uh you know deliver a, a nice result so that's kind of i think something that's up and coming and then finally, I think, uh, you know, we're gonna start getting augmented reality. Here's a picture of Rafid and I uh, using some, some of the, the, the headgear. And, it, you know, I didn't really think it was gonna be, you know, that much different with uh, sort of head forward versus looking at the screen a lot, but the, the, these systems actually provide some value. Um, it takes a little use, you know, getting used to wearing these, uh, these headsets, but um, it's actually pretty cool. So I think that's that's also going to come come down the line, and and um, you know will be part of our uh, OR uh, environment in the future. So with that, I say you know alleviate there is limitations in navigation, but you think of it in intrinsic errors, which are pretty small, e extrinsic errors, which is us the surgeons, and uh, it's user error, and so uh, you know you got to learn how to use the the tool. Um, and, you know, you have to learn how to use, uh, you know, get through the workflow. The workflow is important, but otherwise I think it's um, a very useful thing, especially in deformity surgery, and it's very predictable. So, um, and then the other thing is, you know, you got to build a team. You can't do this all on your own. So with that, I'll end. Thank you.
I'll start off with one for Shane. Um, thanks very much. It was an excellent talk. You know, you really, I think, kind of influenced me in terms of how I think about navigation. I've, I've incorporated it more and more in my practice. Initially, I used it for complex stuff, revision stuff. But I think one thing that you've always stressed is that you don't want to just pull it out when you have like a bear of a case. You want to sort of work, you know, build it into your workflow so you're an expert at it and can apply it to the hard anatomy. Can you kind of, you know, give us some pearls on the learning curve, how someone who doesn't navigate can sort of begin to navigate <laughs> and sort of how to make that transition? Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's, um, you know, it's a complex tool and you can use this as a surrogate for any complex tool that you bring into the um, OR. And it's really important to use it in cases that you don't need it in or don't, you know, don't rely on it. But then you become, you know, good at it and the efficiency is there um, in an easy case. And then you'll find that the efficiency is there in a difficult case. But if you try to use it just in difficult cases and you only use it, you know, uh, a limited amount of time, it's not only you, but it's the person running the system. You know, it's the it's just getting the machine like the workflow. And so yeah, definitely starting with easier cases so that, you know, because, you know, everybody's going to have easy cases. Everybody's going to have hard cases and, you know, build up to the more challenging ones. Yeah. Praveen, you had a uh, question? Yeah, I mean, I've probably, you know, navigated over 700 levels and been pretty happy with the cage placements. So the, a couple of tricks. One is, um, you know, the placement of the reference frame has to go across the SI joint, especially in, in older patients, osteoporotic patients. You have to have that reference frame across the SI joint, um, and that way it doesn't move. That's number one. And then number two is we use bolsters on the patient. Uh, on their scapula and on the buttock area and put the patient against the bolsters and then tape them down so that they can't torque. And then the other trick, well, the other it's not the trick, it's the rule. You always work proximal to distal. So you always work towards your frame with the theory that you're changing the anatomy more proximal and not, not more distal. So that seems to work. And um, uh, I mean, you know, we published... A, paper on the accuracy of navigated uh, um, ATP stuff. And it's, it's uh, you know, it's pretty good. So. But I think those, those three things really help. All right, thanks.